I love cooking and I love teaching people how to cook. Good food is so important, not just for our health, but for our temperament, and it doesn't need to be complicated. For this series, I've created a set of menus which I hope you will try, either as individual dishes or as a complete and balanced meal. We're so lucky to have some of the best raw ingredients in the world. Let's make the most of them. I think salads make wonderful starters, but banish all thoughts of limp lettuce and sliced tomatoes for far too long the default ingredients in so many salad bowls. This is a simple and effective little salad that combines fresh figs, goat's cheese, mint and honey, ingredients that combine to make something far greater than the sum of their parts. Two minutes to assemble, literally, I promise, and you have something fantastic to eat, something really nourishing, delicious and pretty stylish as well. I've got some lovely goat's cheese, and I'm using a St. Tola ashed log that comes from Ina in County Clare. This is one of my favourite um, Irish ingredients. Uh, that is a long list of favourite Irish ingredients, mind you. And the rest of my ingredients then, lovely ripe figs, lemon juice, honey, olive oil, classic combination of flavours, and then some nice peppery rocket leaves, and a few little leaves of mint. And because I happen to have them in the garden at the moment, and because they're delicious and they look quite cheerful, I'm going to put a few little um, petals of marigold or calendula on as well. So, the assembly of the salad could not be easier. Um, I've got, you can do individual plates if you want to. I'm going to do it sort of family style. Lay out some rocket leaves in a sort of an even, what am I going to say, in a not piled up, sort of flat on my dish. And these are small little rocket leaves and really lovely and tender. If the rocket leaves were bigger, I might be tempted to pinch off the stalks if they look tough. But these are beautifully tender, so I'm not going to. Now, so far, so easy. Uh, the next thing I need to prepare are the figs. And this couldn't be easier. So um, make sure they're nice and ripe. Give a little squeeze like that. Lovely. Then just cut off, barely, a little off the top like that. And then, see the way a little bit of sap, a little bit of the fig juice just comes up. Then just cut down through them, like that, but not all the way through. So they're remaining hinged at the bottom, and they open out like a little flower. And we pop those on. One per person. I'm just going to do four of them. I like little, I'm not going to say lotus flowers, but really sort of beautiful looking. Just spread them out. A fig, goat's cheese, all these flavours are just really really nice together great lovely so you can make you can put as many on a platter as you want but as i said i usually allow one per person if it sort of decides to open out like that that's not the end of the world perfect now the goat's cheese so um the goat cheese is quite rich so don't give too much okay so just a sort of a thinnish slice i dip my knife in water which is a bit chefy you don't have to do that but just get a sort of a smoother finish. I definitely always use the lovely ashed end of the log because that's just completely delicious. And then just pop a slice in the middle of each fig flower, if you like. And I don't you see the way the goat's cheese is just slightly yielding there. So it's about maybe not even half an inch thick. Let's pop it in. And the color of the ash and the beautiful shade of white of the cheese. I just think it's brilliant and brilliantly easy and brilliantly quick. Okay, pop that in there. Don't worry too much if they don't sit up all that neatly. Lovely. Next is the honey. Now, um, honey and goat's cheese, as I mentioned, is delicious together, but don't overdo it. And we particularly want the honey here on the goat's cheese. It's also, of course, very good with the fig. So, just runny honey like that, just drizzle. It needs a reasonable amount like that. But as you can see, I'm just focusing mainly on the honey landing on the, whoops, that was a bit generous, on the cheese and the fig. Don't worry if a little runs off onto the rocket. It's all going to taste delicious. Perfect. Um, a squeeze of lemon juice just to sort of temper the honey. And actually the lemon juice can go over everything because lemon juice and rocket is delicious as well. Just like that. Be brave with the lemon. So maybe a little bit more than you think. And if you lose a little pip, like I did, just chase after it. Olive oil, extra virgin olive oil. Again, reasonably brave with this, but don't make the whole thing too oily. Pinch of salt. 
little bit of black pepper for just a little bit of heat. And even like that, that would be lovely. But the other thing which is delicious with it, a little bit of mint. Mint, honey, fig, goat's trees, really great combinations of flavors. It would be perfect like that. But as I said, I have some little marigolds here. And as I pick the marigold up and bring it towards the plate, I wonder, am I making a mistake? Here we go. A few of those. You might think that's uh, too much of a good thing. But anyway, they're in the garden. They're delicious. And it certainly makes the goat's cheese salad with the figs and the rocket leaves look festive. But a great thing to eat. Many people think of squid as something they eat on foreign holidays, but in fact, squid is relatively plentiful in our waters. I love the process of preparing it and the utterly unexpected visual treats that await you when you do that. I'm going to serve it with some richly roasted tomatoes, olive oil and balsamic vinegar. Nothing new there, but when you combine that with spaghetti and courgettes, it's a terrific dish. I love eating squid and I particularly like preparing it. It's one of those ingredients that just, I'm just astonished by it every time. I find it completely intriguing. So uh, this is the little squid, and it, it um, consists of three sort of main things. What's called the sac here, this sort of V-shaped sac, and then there are two little wings, which presumably it uses um, for directional aids when it's under the water. And then we have the tentacles here. So I start off by just separating um, the tentacles from the sac. So just grab it there, just behind the sort of the blood, uh, the inky sort of eyes, and just give it a little pull like that. And that's the tentacles. And then inside the sac, um, there's almost always some little bits of sort of opaque sort of guts, that sort of thing. You can pull those out. If they don't all come out, that's not the end of the world because we're going to be opening it. But there's a little in surprise in store for you because you see what's just appeared. It's this little sort of plasticky looking, um, which essentially is like a sort of a backbone of the squid. Um, and if you give that a little pull, and that's known as the quill. And in here, um, if I puncture one of these, which I wouldn't normally do, but you can do, we've got some squid ink. And that's one of the reasons why squid is sometimes called the scribe of the sea because you've got your quill and your ink. So, yeah, I mean, it's just how amazing. With the little uh, tentacles here, you see we've got, it looks like a little beak. It's sharp, that's what it used to eat. So we just, just pull that out. That we discard. And then we just cut the tentacles just below the inky part there. And that we discard. And then we have the tentacles. That, by the way, is my favorite part of the squid to eat. I love it all. But if I had to choose one piece, that would be the piece. Now, back to the sack. I'm going to just pull off the two little wings there. They just come away easily, like that. And then just usually the little membrane or skin on the outside there, that just comes away easily. So that's the sack. So what I do is just put my knife in along the line of the quill. And if you miss it, it doesn't matter. Not the end of the world, but it just seems to make sense to do that. Then scrape out any of that um, little bits of guts, all the little bits. Okay, we've got the two little wings, the sac and the tentacles. If you put either the wings or the sac straight onto the hot grill pan like that, it just curls up in like a little sort of Swiss roll. So what I do is just score it lightly. And then usually, um, I cut the sack at this stage into a smaller piece like that. So that's those ready for the pan. The tentacles just cook exactly as they are. I usually leave them whole. And then the little wings, just put a few little score marks on those, just so they don't curl up, because I want them to sit flat on the grilled pan to get colour, and colour is the flavour. And that is quite simply how you prepare squid. For me, one of the most marvellous ingredients to prepare in the kitchen. So I want to prepare my courgettes to serve with the spaghetti, which will be the side dish to go with the squid with the tomatoes. 
So um, medium-sized courgette zucchini like that, um, the smaller the better, but better not to have really tiny ones. So I just halve the courgette lengthways like that. I want a little bit of soft texture in the cooked courgette, but I don't want it to be watery as such. So take out some of that excess seed. That's not really bringing anything much to the equation here. And then I'm going to cut these into long, thin slivers, and then we're going to salt them. They salt for about 15 minutes, and as soon as they start to look slightly glazed by the salt, then we will rinse them and dry them, and then they'll be ready to fry. So I have some already on salting. So let's, let me show you what happens when they're on salting, is they get this sort of sheen of water on them like that. It's just a sort of glossy sort of sheen like that. Then we have to just give those a little wash and a dry and those are then ready for frying. So rinse off all of the uh, salt off the courgettes. So give them a good shake around like that. Lovely. And then drain off all of the excess water. Great, that's those. Next thing I'm going to do is get the tomatoes on cooking and I'm using lovely ripe um, cherry tomatoes here and I'm going to grill them. So a very hot oven or under a grill if you have it. And up to the pan, I'm adding some thinly sliced garlic and some olive oil, some thyme leaves. Thyme and tomatoes is a very, very good combination of flavors. That's looking good. Uh, definitely a pinch of salt and some balsamic vinegar and some nice quality balsamic vinegar, about a tablespoon or so on there, or maybe a little bit more. So these will take between 10 and 15 minutes in the oven. Slightly depends how ripe your tomatoes are, and it's lovely when they're really ripe like this, and it depends how hot your oven or your grill is. Lovely. How to Cook Well with Rory O'Connell. Proudly sponsored by Kerrygold. lovely. These are absolutely perfect. So they're just still holding their shape. I'm going to put a little heat under those just when we're frying the squid so that will all come together. Now the courgettes which we salted and rinsed and dried are ready to be fried. So I've got a frying pan ready here with a little bit of heat underneath it. A little bit of olive oil. Check that your oil is hot enough. I just want to turn the garlic a little bit golden and this is going to happen quickly. So just pop in one and it should start to sizzle straight away. And it started to sizzle, but maybe I'll just let it get a little bit hotter. Fried garlic like this is really delicious when it's golden, but when it gets too dark, it becomes bitter. That should be good now. So pop those in. They'll color quite quickly. The aroma that comes up from the pan at this point is fantastic, really delicious. Pinch of chili flakes or dried chili, just for a moment. Either way, they're just getting slightly tinged and then in with the zucchini and that stops the garlic from burning. Good pinch of salt. And just keep frying like that. Okay, these are nearly ready for the spaghetti. They're starting to wilt and tenderize. I've got my spaghetti already cooked and drained, and that's perfectly okay to cook your spaghetti ahead of time. Put it back into the saucepan you cooked it in, and then put the lid back on the pot, and that keeps it quite hot, actually. But what happens when you cook the spaghetti ahead is it just clamps into just one sort of clump like that. What I like to do, when I drain the spaghetti after cooking it, I keep a little bit of the pasta cooking water, put a couple of tablespoons into the clumped up pasta, and then with your hands, it has a miraculous effect of just loosening it. So don't be tempted to put in oil. You don't want to make everything too oily. So it's really amazing. So that's perfect. So turn everything together. Now, a few things we need to add to this at the last minute. Some grated lemon zest. Okay, so lots of lovely zest like that. Some lemon juice, just to freshen up the flavors. It doesn't make the lemon taste any different, by the way, from squeezing it in from a heights. Just to say. 
Okay, just toss everything around. And sometimes a tongs is useful, just lifting everything through. Lovely, that's great. So into a nice hot serving dish. Ouch. I mean, this just eating on its own actually would be fantastic. Scrape all of that lovely pasta out. Get lovely heat from the chili. Okay, a few more rogues there. And then finally on here, the herb of choice, which is just fantastic, is a little sprinkled marjoram on there. And that's delicious. So those are ready for serving with our squid. Now, the squid has been sitting on a towel because we want it nice and dry. And I have a grill pan on heating here. So I'm just going to put a little olive oil onto the grill pan. Then the nice dry squid. So leave them alone to get a bit of color. Some of the lovely tentacles, which as you know, are my favorite bits. Going on. Good pinch of salt, nice bit of pepper. Perfect, beautiful color there like that. So the key is not to cook them for too long. So that's pretty much there. So onto my pan, you can place them individually. I'm going to pop them all on in one go, just slide them on and then arrange them. They're very dramatic and very beautiful looking. Then just toss in the tomatoes. And I love the fact Sarah, that some of those tomatoes are dark, really soft and squishy. And the tomatoes almost make uh, their own sauce. So not a lot of oil, not a lot of vinegar, not a lot of anything, but plenty uh, to give lots and lots of flavor to the dish. And straight off to the table with those, delicious. A simple Victoria sponge filled with cream and raspberries is a classic that deserves the description. But you can also use the batter to make a whole range of different cakes just by the addition of a couple of new ingredients. In our case, toasted coconut and lime. Suddenly a rather genteel cake becomes something distinctly racier and you're one step closer to a tropical paradise. So we're making a type of Victoria sponge here as distinct from a whisked up sponge. And in that case, you start off with butter. So I have my butter at room temperature and you beat it until it loses that sort of lovely yellow Irish buttery color and becomes somewhat sort of paler, more like the color actually of continental butter. Okay, that's looking lovely. So add in your sugar and I usually add in the vanilla extract at this stage, partly because I'm worried about forgetting it in a moment's time. So just a little vanilla, one teaspoon, really as a flavor enhancer here. So that's lovely. And we're going to beat it again until it gets lovely and fluffy looking. And the perspiration that you um, expend, I don't think you expend perspiration, but anyway, you know what I mean, at this point will really pay you dividends in the texture of the cake at the end. So now we can start to add in our eggs. So one egg at a time and um, just beat well between each addition of egg. So at this point, I would just with each egg, I would sieve in a little flour in at this stage. Lovely, another egg. Mix that in just a little. Another tablespoon of flour. This is kind of the be sure to be sure version of making a Victoria sponge. And I say that in the best sense of the word. So second egg in, beat it again pretty vigorously. Third egg going in, third and final egg, another little bit of flour, bring that all together, don't need to beat it indefinitely, the remainder of our flour, which we now sieve in, again sieving just to make sure nothing has fallen into your flour bin and just to bring a little bit of lightness to the equation. And then I just sort of fold that in nice and gently, being relatively sort of tender with the mixture at this point. Okay, that's looking really nice now, sort of just a sort of hesitant dropping consistency. Who knew? 
The rest of our ingredients um, are desiccated coconut and our lime zest, and then um, two tablespoons of lime juice. Lime and coconut, you'll feel like you're in the Caribbean. So fold that in. Love the color of the um, sort of almost dade low lime. Now this is ready to go into our prepared tins. Our oven is preheated as you always do. That's the first thing you do when you're making a cake. Our uh, tins have been buttered. A disc of parchment paper on the bottom of our tin, which you can just about make out there. So divide it as evenly as you can between your two tins. Then we'll smooth off the top and pop it into our preheated oven. This cake cooks quite quickly, about 20 minutes. It's quite a quick cooking cake. So I find a tablespoon is the handiest thing. Just paddle out towards the edge. That's it. And that then is ready to go into our oven to cook. When the cakes are cooked, remove them from the oven, put them onto a wire rack and allow them to cool completely and then turn them out of the tins or turn them out before they're completely cool. And don't forget to remove the parchment paper from the bottom. Then you're ready to make what is, becomes both the filling and the icing for the cake. So I've got some butter. You can make this in a food processor. You can do it by hand if you want to, but honestly, the food processor does this rather brilliantly. So just whiz the butter up a little bit on its own first. That should be perfect now. It's looking again slightly sort of paled in colour. So the rest of the ingredients are going in. Some cream cheese. Everything in the cream cheese is nice and cold at this point. And then we have some icing sugar and some zest of lime going in. And a little lime juice. So three tablespoons of lime juice because we want to cut through the sweetness. And we'll whiz this again until it gets lovely and sort of light and fluffy. And one final ingredient here, a little more vanilla, again, pretty much as a flavor enhancer. So this case, about a half a teaspoon. Okay, that should be um, perfect. So now we're ready to fill and ice. Pop some of your icing into the middle, like that. As you can see, this is quite, going to be quite a luscious confection. And the lid on top, making sure the parchment paper stays behind. So quite a bit of icing on top. And then over the sides. Then with some toasted desiccated coconut over the top. So I've just toasted it in a dry, moderate oven. The final thing I like to do at this stage is just to zest a little more fresh lime over the top. It's very fresh tasting and slightly tart and sharp. Lift it onto a nice cake stand or your favorite cake place. I like to stick a few raspberries on top. This can be served as a morning coffee, afternoon tea cake or after dinner. It's pretty much good enough for any situation. This is a really, really nice cake. <laughs>